If you guys didn't watch the uh, conversation that me and Broderick had about blood glucose levels and hemoglobin A1C on lab work, uh, check out that video. But also, on a similar topic, since we're still talking about blood work, let's talk about hemoglobin, uh, hematocrit, red blood cell count, the elevations of those, depending on mm -hmm. what people are using or taking. And uh, the thing that I, I learned a lot from you in this regard, so it's so awesome to be able to actually have a conversation that you guys are going to get a lot of value out of. But things that people don't know that I learned from him, uh, it's not just like AAS that increase those, it's also peptides, including your, you know, the guilt-free TB500 and BPC157, like mm -hmm. that nobody thinks has any consequences. Those will raise your red blood cell count. If you're engaged in sufficient, and when I say sufficient, I mean sufficient to elite athletics. I don't mean sufficient to gen pop behavior. As the fitness drives up, an assortment of enzymatic shifts take place that make higher and higher values more and more safe and tolerable. There are Tour de France guys. Now, admittedly, that's a phenomenally unique subset and bears no relevance on Joe Average gear user at home. But to give you a frame of reference, there are Tour de France athletes that walk around with otherwise life-threatening terminal hematocrit and hemoglobin values that would be absolutely ambulatory for anyone else. But because of the variety of training and the magnitude of that, the, the magnitude within that variety, they have very, very low clotting factors. They have very, very different blood viscosities, even with these ridiculously high values. So yes, that's an example that has nothing to do with anyone listening to this, but it's an example of your body has programming upon programming upon programming to achieve these states in some level of homeostasis. Mm -hmm. I want to build a picture of the perfect storm of someone that is going to be uh, possibly killed by higher levels. Okay. We're going to take a bodybuilder that was running two grams of test bro yeah. for 16 weeks on his cycle. Mm -hmm. And he was also taking BPC, TB500, mm -hmm. growth hormone, all these other things. He vapes like a fucking son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. He doesn't do any cardio. And he was bulking mm -hmm. on fast food and just increasing calories and he doesn't actually walk or do anything other than play Xbox at night where he smokes weed and goes to sleep. Right. And his hematocrit levels are 60. Yep. Which is a very believable value. And weirdly, probably not hyper dangerous during the window in which they're doing that stuff. But now what invariably happens is their cycle course ends at some point. Yes, the impetus to maintain those high phlebotic values diminishes, but usually far more seripitously and far more acutely, what lowers is their activity. They reduce their training volume. They reduce their activity because they don't have the re recovery ability to live up to those values. So now they were their safety, if it, such as it is, I mean, their, uh, their safety margin right. was maintained by this activity. The activity leaves faster than the impetus to maintain those phlebotic values. So now you have an ever-growing delta of risk. Ooh. Do you, do you see? Yeah, yeah. Add that to the fact that typically, particularly bodybuilders, I hate to just bash you guys, but you're fucking fish in a barrel. Also, as the recovery and the exciting things of drugs diminish, oftentimes does also their care to detail and they're less specific about their ion intake. They're less specific about them staying hydrated. And so that ever growing delta exaggerates even more. And so yes, the natural state is growing delta of risk. And then their somewhat lackadaisical implementation expands that. And so where even though the uh, hematocrit's going from 60 and chipping down toward 50. The 50 is actually more dangerous than the previous 60 because they don't have those other ve support values mm. in place. Yeah, they're not exercising as much. And mm. that's a huge problem. And then add to that just one day of acute dehydration or some clever like, oh, I'll swallow a little diazide to look extra good at the beach this weekend. And you have a sharp drop in blood volume. Well, you don't lose the solid part. You lose the liquid part. And then they wind up with aggregations and blood clots and 
right. potential problems. Uh, and even if those problems aren't catastrophic and they get a fucking you know, a bl brain blood clot or a, 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 you know, a, a clot in their heart, they might... That's not catastrophic. Well, th those are potentially catastrophic. Even but, if it's not <laughs> But it could be much more... Um, much less noticeable and result in just fine stresses on the renal, or renal tissues. Yeah. And so this, you know, this pressure is, oh, you know, steroids are bad for your kidneys, bro. Or it could be just behaving like a douchebag is right. actually bad for your kidneys. It could be that. Or it could manifest in elevations of blood pressure. There's so many things. And even not just like blood pressure as in, oh, your, 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 your values go high. Again, your body's so good at regulating things, it could just be now that your heart is working extra hard to maintain the ah. stasis of things. And now you wind up with left ventricular hypertrophy to counterbalance these things. So even though you didn't get a catastrophic blood clot or some other thing, you just added an ever so slight... A couple you know, millimeters on the left ventricle? Yeah. 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 It doesn't sound very good. Yes. Yeah. And then most people's, and you actually started this conversation with, it, oh, well, the easy head just donate blood this often or that often. Sure, but a... It's not in, enough. In, well, never mind the not enough. Rather than starting with this attitude of, oh, I'll donate blood this often to counterbalance this, maybe, and I realize I'm, you know, a little bit of a fucking maverick on this, but maybe looking at drugs right from the start that are less phlebotic, otherwise known as anabolic androgenic steroids, not fucking testosterone, not fucking testosterone, not fucking testosterone, and maybe looking at drugs that could give you similar secondary effects without that primary effect. And you also mean all the other testosterone-related drugs like sure. halotestin. 100%, um, all the center column drugs. Right.